We're talking about the brain and food connection. How important is food by itself in relating to minimizing depression, social anxiety, and mental health? I think food is extremely important um, because it's directly linked to obesity. And obesity itself causes low-grade inflammation. And foods that are really high, particularly when you combine a high saturated fat with a high refined sugar. So let's say you're eating your, you're drinking your glass of milk with your cookie. Like that's the worst because you're getting the saturated fat and the sugar. That's my whole <laughs> job. <childhood. laughs> and, um, and that's been shown to cause a very high, what's called postprandial inflammatory response. So we've been talking about postprandial glucose response, which is after you eat. So postprandial there's a inflammatory response that also occurs um, after, after eating. And um, inflammation itself has been shown to, it, inflammatory molecules cross the blood-brain barrier and they, they, have, they play a role in, in basically um, depressing dopamine signaling and serotonin and all sorts of, uh, you know, affecting neurotransmitters uh, and brain function. And there's been studies directly showing that if you inject a person um, with an inflammatory cytokine, it causes depressive symptoms versus really injected with saline. Yes. So the more inflammation we have in the body, it increases depression. In exactly. Inflammation. We used to think, again, the brain was separate from the body and that, you know, the immune system and, and all that didn't, didn't, you know, affect the brain. Turns out that was all wrong absolutely wrong. And these inflammatory mediators do get into the brain and they get into the brain and they change, you know, they're changing the, the firing of certain neurotransmitters and things like that. They're also activating the resident immune cells in the brain called microglia, astrocytes, um, a microglia, a type of astrocyte. And, um, you know, that, that also is linked to, to depression. And um, so, mm. We, I, we put out a little short video on this, on uh, an animated video, actually, on depression, inflammation and depression and talk about a lot of the studies uh, because it's something I don't think people realize that the food you eat and not only the food you eat, your lifestyle, you know, being obese and overweight, being sedentary, being sedentary, you know, exercise is one of the best anti-inflammatory medicines you can get, period. And it also happens to be one of the you know, best lifestyle um, remedies for depression as well. And I mean, randomized controlled trials showing that all sorts of evidence. So um, is this any type of exercise or are you a HIIT training, a cardio, a 30 minutes, 60 minutes? What's your opinion? Well, there's been, there's been studies looking at, you know, I, I would say the large body of evidence seems to show aerobic exercise is, is, is really important um, with, with respect to depression. Um, and, and that is because uh, aerobic exercise leads to increases in what's called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, um, BDNF as it's called. It's basically um, a growth factor that's produced. You can, after just 20 minutes of a moderate intensity workout, you can increase your level. You can find levels increased by like up to 30% in plasma. It crosses into the brain and in the brain, um, it does a lot of things. Not only does it it do what IGF-1 does. It, it actually grows new neurons. It helps you grow new neurons and it helps um, your neurons survive. So it plays an important role in preventing brain aging. But something else very unique that it does, it plays a role in what's called neuroplasticity. Yeah. Neuroplasticity is like your brain's ability to adapt to stressful conditions. You know, I mean, this is what children can do pretty, pretty good. Um, as you get older, neuroplasticity goes down, as does everything. But it play, neuroplasticity is important for, for, for being able to cope with stress, like uh -huh. the stress of a pandemic, for example. You know, more neuroplasticity helps with those stressful divorce people are going through, you know, or losing your job. Um, lots, of, lots of stressful things, but, 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 but neuroplasticity helps the brain cope with that. And brain-derived neurotrophic factor helps increase neuroplasticity, which decreases with age. So... Um, Again, aerobic exercise was important, but you know, there's been studies linking strength training to um, lower depression rates as well. Yeah, any so, type of exercise will help. I, exactly, I do, but I really think that aerobic, there is a, there is a place for aerobic with respect to the BDNF, the brain-derived neurotrophic. I always tell people that 
every day I try to put myself through some type of physical pain that makes me feel discomfort, whether that's sweating for 10 minutes or a two hour workout or playing basketball, hiking, whatever. I try to put my mind and body through something where I'm like, gosh, I don't want to do this. But by putting myself through pain, controlled pain, it sets me up to be more under control when there is chaos and pain. Right. And I think that's the, the key we should get to is like controlled pain, healthy pain, so that you're not out of control when there is chaos and pain in the world. It, you're, what you're describing, um, scientists often refer to uh, as hormesis, and that is basically a little bit of stress on the body, like exercise. Mm -hmm. um, basically, because our body tries to maintain home, what's called homeostasis, um, a little bit of stress will cause our body to respond to that stress with a lot of anti-stress, right. anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, mm. growing new brain cells, any, all these beneficial things. So wow. you know, a little bit of stress gives you a lot of good stuff, right? Interesting. Whereas low-grade chronic stress all the time, it, it doesn't do anything. You're not, you're right. not getting that. You're not getting that powerful. Okay. Yeah, this is, power, this is amazing. Um, I'm going to say something that I hope I don't offend anyone when I say it that I am all about self-love, self-care, loving yourself for who you are, accepting yourself for where you're at in your life, physically, emotionally, environment, financially, all that. The more I hear you talk about this, the quote-unquote self-love movement of accept who you are and accept where you're at with your body and what you eat, and it's okay to eat whatever you want, just love yourself for who you are, is that self-love mentality, that specific type of mentality, killing people and hurting them if they aren't willing to adapt a, no, it's not okay to continue to eat whatever you want all the time and just love yourself and accept yourself for who you are. You have to make sure you arm your body and your mind and your health with the nutrients, the tools, the exercise in order to decrease depression and increase happiness. I, I think that there's the, you know, absolutely, if you're going to just eat what you want and accept being obese, um, that you will, you'll be causing yourself more harm and um, both physically and mentally. And, um, and, and that also probably affects your loved ones as well, you, you know, that care about you or perhaps that you're interacting with and you're in a terrible mood. And so, you know, when your neighbor's happy, you're happy, right? You know, so I think that there's, there's part of this movement. I think there's a fine balance between you, you don't want to have your expectations so high that you can never be happy. Yeah. Right? And I'm never going to look like, perfect. And someone's always skinnier than me. And I'm, I'm I never going to have look. blue eyes. I'm never, yeah. I'm never, you know, so if I'm always like, well, only people with blue eyes are the prettiest, like then I'll never be happy. So like, that's an unreasonable expectation. Right. Um, in my mind. So, I mean, there are things where, you know, like I, I'm never going to be a billionaire. And if that, if that's all I wanted in life to be happy, I'll never be happy. So there are things I think that you can, there, there's a certain balance between, I mean, you want your expectations to be high in, in, in a way you want to always aim for what you, you know, aim, aim for the stars in a way and, and, and try to like work hard to get there. So what I'm trying to say is I think that self-love movement came from somewhere, right? I think there was, there was something to that, right? But I think it sort of spiraled out of control and, and um, what, what's happened now is you're saying, well, accept things that I don't want to change mm. rather than you can, because you can change that. You can lose weight. You can um, eat different foods and get Make healthier. different decisions. People that are eating refined sugar, people that are drinking these sugar sweetened beverages, you know, and there's, there's a lot of people, maybe not so many people listening to the podcast or watching it, but um, there are people that do. And, you know, there's been studies that have shown Refined sugar acts on the reward pathway in the brain, dopamine pathway, um, in a very similar manner to controlled substances, um, drugs like nicotine, yes. uh, meth methamphetamine, yep. not to the same degree, but they're acting on the same systems and they're It increases the a feel-good hormone it when does. you take it for the moment, but then it makes you decline afterwards and crash, right? It does. And, and you know, I, I think the important point to realize with that is that when you take that away, when you stop, um, what happens is there is a withdrawal. And, and it's, it's been shown at least with, for example, with nicotine studies that your dopamine's getting constantly fired, fired, fired. And so you're, what's 
called dopamine receptors, um, which basically the dopamine acts on to make you feel good, those start to decrease because your, your neurons are going, oh, well, I have so much of this around. I don't need so many of the receptors. So when you take away that thing that's causing the dopamine all the time to go away, you have let fewer receptors and now you don't feel as much. I mean, it's just really bad. You're not yeah. feeling any amount of dopamine, right? But it's been shown that that sort of normalizes within three months. Huh. And three months is a long time, but it's actually not that long. Of cutting, of cutting out the sugar, you mean? Of like well, cutting. this has been shown with nicotine. I'm just drawing gotcha, a parallel. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm yeah, drawing yeah. a parallel saying, look, it's not going to be easy the first month. It's, it's not going to be easy It's so month. hard. It's so hard. It's not going to be easy the first month. It may not be easy the second month, but it's going to get easier. And it's not only is it going to get easier, you're going to be happier. Your body's going to regulate itself. The hormones are going to regulate, right? Things are going to self-regulate. Things start to, yeah, things start to, to get back to normal. Exactly. It's and very challenging challenging, but it's necessary to get healthier and happier, right? It is. I, I don't think people realize that, you know, depression, it's not, it's not just a genetic disorder. It's not just something that can't be fixed ever. Uh, no, in some cases, you know, there, there are, you know, there are definitely genetic cases of depression. I'm not saying that that's not the case. But can you heal but, depression through food and nutrition and exercise? Well, there have been studies that have shown that exercise can be a treatment for depression. And there have been studies that shown um, uh, changing someone's diet can also improve depression, depressive scores. Um, and particularly the, the combined two uh, is even more robust, which mm. makes sense. Um, you know, so there's something for people to realize people that are maybe eating a, a not so healthy diet, people that are overweight, um, you know, overweight, definitely obese, and um, if they if they do have depression, that there 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 very well could be a link between you know between the the diet, the, the lifestyle, the obesity. You know you know fat cells itself they also increase they they produce inflammatory cytokines. Mm. So independent of the whole eating the diet and the postprandial inflammatory response, just having fat like particularly visceral fat around, like around your organs and stuff like this stuff this stuff is causing low-grade inflammation. And do you know Pretty, what low-grade yeah. inflammation is? What is it, it means do? that you're basically activating your immune cells a little bit all the time. And activated immune cells require a ton of energy. So you're taking energy away from your brain. From defending from, itself, yeah. From from just just having, you know, having a great day from, I mean, mm. energy. So just having so energy. energy. It's like yeah. a sink, exactly. Just having energy. It's a sink, low-grade inflammation. I mean, you were telling me this, you, you know, we were chatting a little bit earlier about how you were eating this terrible diet back when you were yes. doing your arena football and you were always tired. Always tired. Low-grade inflammation, it, it's an energy sink because it requires so much energy to activate your immune cells. And there's only so much energy. It's like a triage, right? It's triaging yeah. there. It's taking so, it somewhere else. And it takes you away from your mission, from your vision of your life, from your career, from your energy with your family, your friends. Yeah, you have to have ones. energy. I mean, it takes motivation to want to go to the gym. It takes yes. motivation also to want to like do stuff or to talk to people to, you know. Is there a genetic thing that or DNA thing that holds someone back from losing that weight if they've tried for years? Or is this still uh you know they're just lacking the discipline what what is that there's absolutely many genes that regulate um obesity and 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 my like i'll, I'll just tell you my mother-in-law she is also um little she's not yet you're not obese she's you know had has in the past had an overweight problem and has tried i mean she is the kind of person that tries and goes yes. all in and she has tried every diet, just everything, and just nothing seemed to work. So, I mean- How does someone like that, if they've tried, 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 and it's just like, you know what? I'm beating myself up. The diets I'm trying, the exercise is not working. What do they need to shift? Well, to I do, so you asked about genetics, and it, 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 there is a really important role for genetics as well. But I think that um, in order to know that, you're going to you're gonna have to measure biomarkers in your blood. So you're going to have to measure- lipids like your LDL cholesterol, different particle sizes of those cholesterol, inflammatory biomarkers like high sensitivity reactive protein, your triglycerides, your HbA1c, which is a long-term measure of your long-term wow. blood glucose levels. Measure those things. And also you can get a genetic test. There's a variety of genetic testing services out there, 23andMe, AncestryDNA. I do have a genetic report 
that basically we look exclusively um, or looking at genes that are affecting basically interacting with diet. So people that are eating a high protein diet, some people with a certain SNP, which is a one change in one nucleotide of DNA in a gene, basically can gain more weight. Uh, and the opposite is true, as like I mentioned, or eating the ratio of saturated fat to polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fat. So saturated fats found in foods like dairy, red meat, fatty cuts of red meat, polyunsaturated fats found in fish, monounsaturated fat is found in olive oil, olives, you know, nuts. So these things, like the, even the ratio of those things can affect depending on someone's genetics, their ability to, to gain or lose weight. But can and, you, and, and more so, like even people, so, there's some people have it where they eat a high carbohydrate diet uh -huh. and they gain more weight. So is there, so, <laughs> is there a, is there a, so it's not as simple as what I'm hearing you say as just eat less calories a day and you should lose weight. Not like if always. You, if it, you suppress the calorie intake, you're going to burn more and eventually you're going to burn, you know. I think that's the one thing that's pretty tried and true is that your caloric restriction, most of the time people will, you know, lose weight. Lose weight. Gotcha. They will. Okay. But, you know, the question is how sustainable is that? You know, so you maybe, maybe you, what you would need to do, you know, the other thing is that a lot of times obesity, there's, there's a dysregulation in hormones, mm -hmm. hormones like insulin, leptin is another big one. Yeah. And you have to reset those hormones in order to like have a normal biology. Yes. And sometimes resetting those hormones takes a reset. That's kind of a strong stressor, like, like a long fast, mm -hmm. a long fast, you know, Gosh. where you're basically, you're basically resetting those things. And, and that's what did it for my mother-in-law. So mm. that was my long story. She did a long, did a long fast she and did helped her reset. A couple of them. So she did. Now, by the way, you know, when I say a long fast, typically intermittent fasting is, is anything less than 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Uh, a longer fast would be longer than 48 hours. Three than two days. plus days. Yeah. No, she did the first time she did a three day. She started out by doing um, sort of a, a caloric restriction, low calorie yep. diet yep. just to kind of get her into it. And then she did a three day fast where she didn't eat anything, a little bit of salt. She would take a little bit of salt in and drink some water. And then she did four days. Um, and she did this like, you know, separated by like a month. And that reset her metabolism. And all of a sudden, she started losing weight, you know? Wow. Um, and this has also been the case for a few, a few other friends of mine, particularly one that was morbidly obese and he lost like 180 pounds. Oh my gosh. If you wanna learn about the key foods you need to eat to master your health, make sure to watch this video right here. Are really important and the food that you're gonna find, micro foods that you're gonna find them in are whole foods. You're gonna find them in plants, you're gonna find them in meats. Meats are a great source of micronutrients. Really? Organ meats are also a great source. Organ Not meats. Not a lot of people. Yeah, organ meats.